জয়তে বসেন বঙ্গভূতে সংস্কৃত লেখনী রূপেন আহা লেখনী রূপেন আহা লেখনী রূপেন ভালোবাসা দুহিতারে বড় ভালোবাসি ষোলো কলা বেড়ে বেড়ে আজ তার আসি বড় খুশি বঙ্গবাসী তাই দলে দলে আসি তাই নাচি গাই হাসি আজ তার আসি সুবির সখারা তার এক এক নরেশ চোখে স্বপন মাখা কেনেতে সরেশ মানব চিত্তে মাখে অমিয় ফুল সাহিত্য বোধ জাগে তুলনামূলক ফার্স্ট বেঞ্চ ভাবে শুভা দেব তার ক্লাস শিবাজি ও রুন্ধুতি মনে তার বাস করান না শুধু তিনি করেন গরান राधा रानी माता जाल नरेंद्र पिता ए मानव जमीन दुहिता से सीता रामायण तार गवेषणा खाता घुराइल कत ज्ञान घुराइल माथा मई घोड़ा रोग सतेक पुष्टि तार एक मोरग গৌহরিণী এ শহরে ছড়ানো ছিটানো গুনে কিংবা গুনে ধার কঠিন মিটানো অনেক পুরস্কারে তিনি যে ভূষিতা আমাদের সকলের প্রিয় নবনীতা বাংলা গগনে তুমি রহ জল যুগ যুগ থাক ওই লেখনি সচল যুগ যুগ থাক ওই লেখনি সচল সকল ভাষায় তব অনায়াস গতি তবুও তো বাংলার প্রেমে তুমি সতি প্রত্যুৎপন্ন হে তোমার যে মতি অঙ্গ মননে দিক ভবিষ্য গতি আহা ভবিষ্য গতি আহা ভবিষ্য গতি জয় জয় নবনীতা জয় দেব নমস্কার আমরা যে কোনো কারণেই হোক যে ভিডিওটা দেখালাম এই ভিডিওতে একটা গান ছিল যে গানটা আমরা নবনীতা দেব সেনের জন্মদিনে আমরা শুনিয়েছিলাম এই গানটি লিখেছিলেন রঙ্গন চক্রবর্তী আর সুর দিয়েছিলেন দোহার সুর দিয়েছিলেন দোহার এই গানটা আমরা নবনীতা দেব সেনের আশিতম জন্মদিনে রবীন্দ্র সদনে শুনিয়েছিলাম আমরা গত তিন বছর ধরে নবনীতা দেব সেন স্মারক বক্তৃতা আয়োজন করেছি গত বছর তার আগের বছর দু বছর হয়েছে এই বছর তিন বছরে পা দিল আর এ বছরে স্মারক বক্তৃতা দেবেন গায়ত্রী চক্রবর্তী স্পিবাগ এবং তার সঙ্গে চেয়ার করবেন আশিস নন্দী আমি অন্তরাদিকে ডেকে নেব আজকের এই অনুষ্ঠানটা পরিচালনার জন্য
to uh, hear um, Dr. Spivak and to, you know, pay uh, uh, their tribute to uh, Navunita Dev Sen and, you know, to be part of this evening. Uh, so it's wonderful, but at the same time, it's very sad that a lot of people who have been really trying to get in haven't been able to get in. Um, I don't know how to manage that. We thought 500 would be uh, enough, but clearly it's not. Um, so we'll get to the third Navonita Devsan Memorial Lecture. Um, this this uh, lecture was instituted by his uh, Publishing by Opu Dev, who you see, and uh, by Shudhang Shushekar Dev, who started this publishing um, shortly after Navanita Devsen passed away. So the first uh, first Navanita Devsen memorial lecture was on the 13th of January 2020 to celebrate her birthday. This was the visit. This has been celebrating Navanita's birthday. Um, the song that we couldn't properly hear uh, earlier um, was actually written for her 80th birthday and performed for her 80th birthday. So this is continuing that tradition of celebrating Nobunita's birthday through this memorial lecture. And um, so that was on the 13th of January. So this being a weekend, we are doing it on on. Uh, Saturday, today, and uh, Dr. Rajesh Pivat has very kindly uh, agreed to uh, deliver this um, lecture. Of course, it's early morning in New York, where she is, um, and Dr. Ashish Nandi, in spite of having enormous difficulty with uh, internet today, has uh, managed to be here with the help of a friend and I'm very grateful to both of you, all of us, uh, on, on behalf of uh, uh, Opu from Des and um, my sister and me from the family. I'm very grateful that you are taking this trouble today. And a warm welcome to all of you who have come. Um, now, I, I think I should introduce, uh, um, but I don't really, of course, we always say so and so does not need an introduction, but in this case, uh, clearly uh, Dr. Shrivak does not need an introduction. However, when I asked her about it, she sent me an introduction and I will read it out. Uh, she said, Gayatri Chakravarti Shrivak is university professor at Columbia University. She has written a few books, received a few prizes, and holds a few honorary degrees. For many years, she has been grappling with finishing a book on W.E.B. Du Bois. Humanities for Social Justice is her obsession. Her friendship with Navanita Dev Sen was based on this shared conviction. Now, to this very modest uh, introduction, I must add that her range of interests and expertise is quite stunning as, as most of you know, from Gramsci to Derrida, from Yeats to Mohasheta Devi, from a deep theoretical understanding uh, of, you know, theoretical to uh, running elementary schools and working with villagers in the in the rural uh, in rural Bengal, she has actually done. Uh, she still continues to do a whole lot of things. And her work explores feminism, Marxism, postcolonialism, um, deconstruction, translation, subaltern studies. One could just go on and on. But um, I think I'll, 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 you get the idea, so I won't go on anymore. You know about her and her work, I'm sure. Um, so I will actually. I uh, request uh, Dr. Ashish Nandi to chair the session. We're very grateful that he could come. We also don't need to introduce Dr. Nandi, but uh, in, in a nutshell, uh, Dr. Nandi, Dr. Ashish Nandi, as we all know, is a, a political psychologist and um, 
a sociologist. He has worked in various areas. He's worked with violence. He's worked with, um, uh, he's actually for several years now, he's been working on, on genocide and he has worked on uh, marginalization and uh, cultures of uh, knowledge. Basically, he's been working on cultures and systems of knowledge. And the most important thing is that he brings to it uh, a very healthy skepticism about uh, you know, our package solutions to unwieldy problems. And he has a fantastic wit, which, uh, and he's never hesitant about stating his mind, and uh, which has uh, occasionally got him into trouble. But um, Dr. Ashish Nandi is um, someone that we all uh, deeply respect and love. And I, I would request him to take over as the chair of this session. <coughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. It's a pleasure being here in this lecture, not only because Gayatri is speaking, but also because it celebrates a writer, a writer who was one of the most life affirming persons I've met in my life. I would like to dispense with, very humbly, the convention which dominates the whole of South Asia when introducing the, the speaker. Namely, you say, you have to say that the speaker does not need an introduction and then go on half an hour on that, <laughs> on, on how to say, talking about her, her, him or her and uh, spelling out her, everything from her ranking in college days to her honorary degrees in, ah. in the late life. But I would very much like to hear Gayatri today for two reasons. Firstly, she also has been a life affirming character. She has a strong academic background, but she also has her ethics, her uh, public responsibilities, what she considers that, I will, I will, I will, what she will call probably public responsibility or political responsibility. And she, in some sense, is a bridge between somebody like Namanita Dev and the audience here today. Because a subject is Sita, and I would like to hear what she makes out of it. Indian epics have various characteristics. Three of them are vital, and I would like to uh, spell them out a little bit. I won't take much time, not more than another two couple of minutes. First, Even though the women characters may not seem adequately uh, covered, or uh, if you remember Rabindranath's thing, uh, piece on Kabbe uh, Upekhita, for instance. Mm. Um, nonetheless, mm. nonetheless, there is very little doubt that in the epics, the women are very strong characters. This is one. And Sita is one of them. 91 participants. Video chalate chai, And I, Note. 
महाभारत बट इवन इन रामायण आई रिमेम्बर Sita comes off as a much stronger person than her husband. <clears throat> the Indian epics have, and now I, for a moment, I take on the responsibility of responsibility of a psychologist. The strong psychoanalytic blend. It is this that Indian epics heroes. Have usually three characteristics. Why Indian? Or it is globally. Globally, epic uh, heroes have three characteristics. Two of them are very conspicuous all over the world. One, the epic heroes have have a mystery surrounding their birth. There is a, a, a their birth is a mysterious affair. and something out of ordinary to the all the heroes epic heroes undertake a journey which test their skills and if they are find up to the up to tackling with whatever dangers or challenges they face they prove themselves worthy of being heroes and third and this says something about it indirectly about it that at some point their feminine traits also come out and it is not seen as a handicap or a shortcoming of the hero but as, as his completeness as a human being people have asked me Um, uh, this question often enough those who study epics from a psychoanalytic point of view why why for instance the heroes cry in indian films an african philosopher said i was such an admirer i have such an admirer of amitabh bachchan but why does he have to cry sometimes why heroes do not cry i i didn't go into a long discussion on this <laughs> on this but that's one third of us but it is you, you unless and until you have shown that feminine streak or if i may put it or uh, in another way the feminineity in uh, as a dimension of your personality you are not a complete human being it, it is this is not an ordinary shoron only it is from there all the way down So this this is the and for indian heroes heroines heroes there is a additional thing which i have not seen in other cases namely that the heroes have to negotiate between two images or imagos of uh mother mother and they how they negotiate it one one powerful but also destructive chobita chobita other Uh, 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 powerful but benign. Hmm. Uh, I would suspect that this is perhaps not unique to India, but perhaps with all rice cultivating civilization. For some reason, I don't know. I have not studied that in India, but that is the thing. Uh, with in this few words, I hand over the. microphone to gayatri thank you very much for being here
Thank you, Ashish. Shall I, shall I start, Antara? My thanks to Surya Parekh for laboring with me to give something like a final form to these remarks and putting the images together. And my thanks to Antara and Nandana Sen for having asked me to present this lecture. I thank Anil Atarjo and Anirban Bhattarji for providing access to Navunita Devshin's introduction to the Radharani Devi inaugural lecture in Pratidin. I thank Moinak Bishash for access to the photographs of my 75th birthday party, lavishly arranged by Navunita in 2017. It would have been easier for me to have presented these remarks in Bengali. But Navonita's intervention into our world of work was altogether international, and English is our international language. I have mingled in Bengali with English from time to time. I should say to those who do not grasp Bengali that there will be nothing in the Bengali that is not in the English, except for the irreducible difference between target and original. Thank you. My title is A Tribute to the Incomparable. Incomparable. Navonita Devshen was and is incomparable. Tulonahina. Of course, Rabindra Shangit was in her blood. I would like to think that she died singing. In the song, the poet just catches a glimpse of her. In biographical fact, this is perhaps, as we know, Vittorio Campo, Gobinonath Tagore's friend 15 years before his death. I have appropriated the line for my great good fortune in encountering Nabunita Dev when I was 15 and she was 19. I did not just catch a glimpse of her. I walked with her across the ocean all my adult life. Shudhu pathe jete dekhi ni. Shunyo sagore ropat theke haat odhore thi shara dibon. But no invocation of incomparability is complete without a reference to our personally shared adolescence. Pajimi korechyanek actually. In our teenage, everywhere, in the streets, the loudspeakers played, Johi hotum, khodaki kasam, la jawabuhu. Whoever you are, I swear by Allah, you are incomparable. Muhammad Rafi singing in Guru Dutt's incomparable film, Chaudhavika Chan. There are not too many people among the listeners who are old enough to sense the importance of that song, traveling quite out of its trance context in the film. And for me, the voice that bound me in those early years, when we ran the undergraduate circle at Presidency College, 1957 to 61, when I left Calcutta and our friendship was put on hold for a decade or so, was of course the voice of our professors and among them most strongly, Taruk Natshin. Indeed, it was Taruk Babu's speculation that I had compromised my chances of a first class MA because of my harsh criticism of the university as the editor of Presidency College magazine that made me borrow money on a so-called life mortgage, get admission on a series of very difficult international phone calls, booking trunk calls at the Baligant post office with Cornell University and leave quickly. When in December, 2020, I gave a memorial lecture for Krishna Basu, like Navunita Dev and me, a Presidency College English honors student. I also invoked Tarubabu 
to bring in the secular transcendental strictly to be distinguished from the supernatural. In the present case, I will invoke his way of teaching reading to efface oneself as far as possible and attempt to enter the space of the poem, the space of the text, to wish as it wishes, to experience it as a field of desire from within. I am actually describing how he taught us to be possessed by it as it were. This influenced us. Here is how Nabunita describes Buddha Bosch's tremendously intimate reading of Baudelaire. Buddha Devi hoye porlen Baudelaire er jontrona jorjor attar shikar ei tarok babu shikha to be possessed by what you are reading. Buddha Dev amon bhabe Baudelaire porchen je tini Baudelaire er shikar hoye gelen Baudelaire attar jontrona okay so let me go into the english the Buddha Dev himself became the prey of Baudelaire's pain ridden soul, possessed, haunted. And for me, the word incomparable is like a bell that tolls me back to Nabunita's Shakespeare's Sonnet 18, the, the sonnet that we learned from Tarubam. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate, Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed. And every fair from fair sometimes declines by chance on nature's changing course, untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade nor lose possession of that fair thou owest, nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest, so long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. In that last line, there is an assurance that as long as the words live, the subject of the poem will also live. I want to bring that immortality to the incomparable by way of a tribute written centuries ago and given to both of us by our teacher. I want to put myself in comparaison with the incomparable. Comparaison is a Martinican Creole word that Franz Fanon describes in the following way. Les personnes de couleur sont comparaison, c'est-à-dire qu'à tout instant, ils se préoccuperont d'auto-valorisation. Chaque fois qu'ils se trouvent en contact avec un autre, il est question de valeur, de mérite. Ils sont toujours tributaires, tributaires de l'apparition de l'autre. Tributaires. I am tributary. This is a tribute. I am tributary to the appearance of the incomparable. And Fanon's uh, text reads, peoples of color are comparaison. That is to say that at each moment, they are preoccupied with self-valorization. Whenever they are in contact with another, as I am with Nabunita, it is a question of value, of merit. They are always tributaries of the appearance of the other. We are in a tributary relationship in the discipline of comparative literature, creolized comparison, which allows the diasporic to valorize herself. I will attempt this by way of intertextuality, where one text, mine, would make its point by weaving itself with another. Nobunitas, a short silk, as it were. Nobunita Bhashai, Dui Shomalochok Shoye Bilashi Chinangshu. 
This is her description of Buddha de Bosch as a poet, Bilashi, Jinangshuk. My appropriation of it, glossing intertextuality as shop silk, is to describe it as the luxurious China silk of two critics, Dui Shamalotuk, Shoyer, Bilashi, Jinangshuk. Luxurious China silk of two critics, girlfriends, just as, as a diasporic, Comparaison is for me creolized within the French empire. So does girlfriend come to me, a New Yorker, from within black female idiom, the closest thing to show you by the group of cultural workers founded by Namunita. The sense of text in intertextuality is as in textile and textere, the Latin verb, to weave, woven together. How did the friendship begin? Let us look at it in Nabonita's own words, written the day before I inaugurated the lecture series, memorializing her mother, Radharani Devi, on July 15, 2020. She wrote, how happy I am, how at peace to have found Gayatri, as the first speaker in my mother's memory. That is because one, mother knew Gayatri, and two, liked her. In our student days, there was a committee called Undergraduate Circle, and we met in someone's home, sometimes also at our house, Bhalo Basha. Gayatri was then an English honors student at presidency, tall, rosy, in skirt and shirt, knee length black hair, down her back. And then she has a picture of, of me there. In, in, this is in Protidin. And then she goes to, this is a picture of my 75th birthday. She gave me a traditional 75th birthday in 2017. And she's getting that So this is from the birthday. And I'll show two more that Moina sent me just to give witness to how we met and how much our friendship continued. This is one and go to the other. Okay. Even Nabunita's incomplete bibliography is impressive. And she was many things, teacher, mother, risk taker, we have all enjoyed Chak Bahone Makmahone, traveler, translator, poet, fiction writer, networker. When I spoke to the last temple dancer or Devadasi in Orisha, it was from Nabunita that I got the cloak and dagger trajectory to a successful contact. But today I will focus only on two pieces of work. Shita Theke Shuru, rough translation, Sita at the origin, and the essays in Ishare Pratidandi, Ibam Onnanno Prabandho, rough translation, God's antagonists, and other essays. Because there, the intertextuality is firm. I should mention that the latter text, God's Contender, is soon to be made available to her readers. In the late 80s, I was reading the Mahabharata with Bimal Krishna Motila. And I asked Nabunita about women's appropriation of that thick text. She and I had long conversations, but the detail that I kept in my head and used, it's in my piece in uh, the Force of Law, uh, it kept in my head and used in my understanding, as well as in my writing, was that the female tradition the one powerful ending in the female tradition, as Nobunita told me, was not the truth-telling eldest brother climbing to heaven, but Draupadi, the polyandrous queen, married to all five brothers who had been wagered in the royal dice game, Badidekitilukati, and finally became the efficient cause of the great battle. Draupadi at the end of the Sri Mahavarat, laughing, in the destroyed camps with the countless dead from both sides littering the bloody ground. 
I had got interested in Sita as the feminine transcendental. I heard Nabunita give one of her superb science fiction-like re redoings of the Ramayana at the 200th anniversary of Presidency College University. I invited her immediately to come to Columbia and present that extraordinary material. Antara and Nandana will remember the tremendous audience reaction and what a fantastic performance she gave and she drew me into the occasion. Tahole Draupadir Ottahashi, Sri Mahabharata Sheshe, Lashe Bhurti Shibire, Bhaiye Bhaiye Mrittu, Sri Ramayana Kichi Logo, I asked Nabunita, what is there in the women's Ramayana? In her own work that she gave me, Sita Theke Shuru, and it is Sita at the origin that shows the nature of our relationship. Two different kinds of work supplementing each other. Here then is my understanding of the importance of Shita Tikeshuru. First, humor. In her use of the everyday English words that grace everyday spoken Bengali, it makes the epic open to management. It brings it into our, our hands. It makes the epic open to management, ironizes its distant grandeur. Okay, those who don't understand Bengali, you can hear rocket. Rocket, the Hanuman became like a rocket. Hey, yo, bole, take off, Colin. Okay, there you go. 13, 13, I mean. Bharat Bhumi, Bhumi, Pobitra, Adi, Kabe, Kabe, Mohanai, Kabe, Chiroji, Bhi, Hote, Chan, Kabe, Dhojjo, Dharu. Shudhu, Mori, Rakhbe, Jai, Roy, Jai, Shoy, Shai, Roy, Narod, Hasya, Kolden. Agun, Nibri, Shita, Kori, Khelte, Boslen. Takhon, Goru, Re, Tripai, Ramlokhan, Dippaman, Shita, Arudhar, Kimba, Amar, Shanghar, Bole, Jalamoi, now those who don't understand Bengali, slogan. Jalamoi slogan dite dite Ramchandro, Digun Uddame Judde Japi Porchin. Shitar Uddhar, Kimba Attar Shangha, Inkilab, Dindabad. Bole, Jalamoi slogan dite dite Ramchandro, etc. So, this, this humor of using the, um, the words, the English words that we use in everyday Bengali, that's real Bengali. That really does have a great effect in Shitateke Shuru. By comparison, my work is humorless high theory. I'll come to it because of our connection. Secondly, the suggestion from Nabonita that the events in the epic are fictive. The entire terrible end of the Ramayana, her fire test and her disappearance into the earth, which is presented as worked by a gadget, Vishamitra Votam, worked by a gadget devised by the divine engineer Bishamitra, which slides Sita into the whirling river. Is the result, all of this is the result of the envy of Valmiki, the poet of the Ramayana in Sita Tikeshuru. Again and again, Valmiki intervenes to change the course of the story. But this first intervention, a result of envy, brings us to the third point, the absolute seriousness of the feminist critique. Balmiki scolds Rama. I have highlighted the passages where Balmiki is made to use everyday English words. Slide 14. Surya. Okay, Can you see? No. Now, yes. There. Balmiki is talking to to uh, Ram and he's talking about Mohashir Dosh Matha, Char plus Ak plus Panch. Okay, then he's, he's criticizing Sita for having come with Hanuman, over smart Badur, etc. I've, I've also highlighted Ayonija, not born of a vagina, because that will actually be something both Nabunita and I will later pick up. But this one is just Balmiki's use of those English words 
that are humorous. And then the, his point is by letting an ape bring Sita back and melting in erotic passion, he has ruined the heavenly plot of the epic. And he asks, Now how will faith be reestablished? And about what will I write the Ramayana? So this whole business of the Ramayana being a fictive text, an open text, this is also a very important step. If I had a lot of time, I would connect it with Simon Gikandi's point about how to undo genocide in Africa by rewriting the old narratives. Now, how will faith be reestablished? And what will I write the Ramayana with? He then accuses Sita of behaving immodestly in embracing an ape. Sita interrupts him and reprimands him from a moral high ground. Balmiki gives way to stammering. To restore the storyline, Sita climbs back on the great ape, the devoted Hanuman. The responsibility of the writer gives way to gender envy. Balmiki says through his teeth, Teji me manush, dekenevo. A woman of spirit, we shall see. The possibility of the reclaiming of such a responsibility is contained in the words, Kolom jarhate, bhavishyat tarhate. Who holds the pen, holds the future. Balmiki says it in gender wrath, but its agency can be transformed. It's just a declarative. Kolom jarhate. Ram is the champion of Aryanism, the king of India at the moment. Navunita's restrained admiration is for the heroic kingdom of Lanka. And I remember Tarok Babu talking about Shelley's reading of Paradise Lost with Lucifer as the hero. Navunita's restrained admiration is for the heroic kingdom of Lanka. One of the most sustained moments of feminism in the book is the proud statement of sexual hunger made by the demon princess Shurpanaka, who's stronger than both the guys. I could not share my take on Sita with Navonita. The years between 2018 and 2021 passed too fast. My supplement was presented at various museums and festivals and at the 50th anniversary of the Art Critic Association in Paris. At first, an intervention into Derrida in the name of Sita. And I quote, Derrida describes mapmaking, the first writing, as the wounding of the forest rather than the scarring of the soil. Writing as the possibility of the road and of difference, the history of writing and the history of the road, capture of the via rua, of the path that is broken, beaten, fracta of the space and of repetition, because you can use map, trace by opening of the map, the divergence and violent spacing from nature, the forest that is natural, edge, salvage, place of safety. Is savage, the via ruptas as matter as such. Today, it's the beginning of the Anthropocene. I insert the feminine transcendental here in the broken earth of agriculture. The pharaoh, Bustrophedon, the writing round and round, Bustrophedon, just what map making is not. I give to you that account from the Indic epic. I give to you that account from the Indic epic, Ramayana of Sita the girl child emerging from the end of the plow's furrow as marking the skin of the earth, the harsh scarring of the soil with the end of the plow. Here is the epic story. You can see this, Kshetram Langalat Uttitamam, Kshetram Shodhyata Labdha Namna Sita Iti Vishuta, etc., etc., Bhutalat Uttitasa, and she is Ayonija, as you say, Virya Shulta Iti Me Kanya, Stapita Iyam Ayonija. And that this only bride price is valor. She will not be given in exchange for money. So the um, 
Now, one time, as uh, I was plowing a field, a girl sprang up from my plow. I found her as I was clearing the field, and she is thus known by the name of Sita. Sprung from the earth, she has been raised as my offspring. And since she was only, she was not born from the womb, my daughter has been determined as one for whom the only bright price is valor. I recall the Rohingya girls paying the price of valor in rape, but we can't talk about them here. This feminine transcendental cannot be captured or represented within marriage in the narrow sense as the establishment of legitimacy. And yet that's the only discourse available to tie her down. The appearance in the pharaoh is recounted by her foster father at open court, where Sita is about to choose a noble husband, and her value is given as a bright price. The project is to tie her in the contract of legit legitimacy, to procreate her, to make her property. At the end of the epic, Sita disappears into the earth, refusing to be tested for fidelity by her husband, also in open court. In her disappearance, just as she had appeared by scarring the earth, in her disappearance, her last move, withdrawal into earth, she undoes the violence of the first act of writing on the earth to close the inauguration of the feminine transcendental as writing in general. For lack of time, I cannot here ask you to meditate upon the fact that this narrative of the withdrawal of sexual difference as pure trace, as gender differentiation in LGBTQ is devolving and staging today, can still only be disclosed as the uncoupling of something like a marriage between the plow and the earth, represented as marriage as contractual fidelity. Let us consider how this uncoupling is staged in the final book of the Ramayana. Here again, I connect with Nabonita. Nabonita writes about that passage in Vashita Patali Jurajashi. Nabunita writes about Shita's absolute, absolute uh, grandeur. And I, I just look at the passage here. The, the passage, which is not translated well at all, the, and the translation has been modified by me. In this passage, Sita does nothing but speak a syllogism in a lowered voice. There is no emotion here, no in this passage, Sita does nothing but speak a syllogism in a lowered voice. The only other detail is her adjective, Kasha Vasini, wearing a crew in mourning, Urakapur, Echara Kichune, Echa Akmatru, eyes and face lowered, hands already cupped in the worshiping or rather praying mode, in order not to exoticize unnecessarily. Think of last names in your own voting block. And then see that what you have on the screen couples two last names. The first is simple enough, Raghava of the Raghu dynasty. But Madhavi, same suffix in the feminine, is not the goddess's name. The dictionary says it is so by citing only the passage in the Ramayana we are reading. Dictionaries are made by human beings. And even in our digital world today, the buck stops with a human programmer. This name Madhavi, that can serve as adjective to Devi or goddess, can be read as coming from honey and can remind us of the near animist ecological lines where nature is declared as blessing through honey and the dust of the soil is compared to honey, Madhumat Pativam Raja, one of many possible invocations of the ecological cycle going round and round to sustain not making maps for the Anthropocene. She does not address this generalized goddess. She says, because I have not thought of anyone other than Raghava, therefore the honeyed goddess should give to me her vivara. A reasonable declaration, perfectly appropriate to a court of law, should. The authoritative Sanskrit dictionary gives us the meaning of the word vivara as fisher, hole, chasm, slit, cleft, hollow, vacuity, 
also applied to the apertures of the body and mechanical genius. I supplement by citing her voice of steel. Normorita knows that voice. She speaks of Sita's dhatavoshital control, metallic cold voice, and goes on to say, Ram arute pelin, eshita shonar nai, lohar shita, ar matir manushni. Ram realized further, this Sita is not gold, but iron. Sita is no longer a woman of the soil. Shantosh Karmuka, a landed rural high school teacher, is collecting examples of the rural oral tradition for a bilingual series of a thousand years of Bengali texts. He tells me that his life has changed as he pursues this fieldwork. He is learning how to compose in some of those traditions and composing so that the traditional practitioners can connect their cultural conformity to contemporary political tasks. As I told his daughter, who helped make the videos, Ami Dekte Chaichilam, Shantosh Gaiche, O Buddhi Kormi, Sabal Tanir Kachi Shikhe, Shekhatche. This is Ramshi. Linden Kotche, the Baul Gharana, Linden Kara. I want to show that Shantosh, the intellectual, is learning from the subaltern how to teach them, as Antonio Ramshi wanted. He's learning from them how to teach them in song and also doing linden or exchange as in the baul or local minstrel style. The songs are about Shita. I will read my comments slowly before I play clips of Santosh singing. When he sings, he's not a singer, so he's very worried and his daughter has made the, his daughter has made the video. And the cut, cutting and chopping is done by us, so it's not done well. When he sings, Ishpatir Shita Chayamade, we want the Sita of steel. He intuits the steely and syllogistic rationality of Sita in the courtroom, ignored for thousands of years by almost one and all. And he criticizes the theocratic state structure that is beginning to infect India. When he sings in the second song, Shita Amar Matir Me, Rajwari Te Thakena, Shita is Earth's girl, doesn't live in palaces. He confronts the subaltern with the devastation of primary production in that area with the exploitation through the high production seduction of chemical fertilizers and genetically engineered seeds. The very last line, Mati Te Shita Kunji Amra, Atto Kutha Jabona, we look for Sita in the soil, we won't go elsewhere, brings forth the injunction to want to save the soil by way of biopolitical metaphors scorned by elite theorists who swear by Foucault. Our work is tributary. This is a tribute, supplemental. Go for it. China go sonar sita, sita di deko ni polika. Ke khatiyar ke je bhi jal, agu nahi bolye di bekta. Sita di deko ni polika. Is pater sita chaiya madhe. China go sonar sita, jab na China ko to nar sita, sita di deko ni polika. Thank you. 
When I showed the Whitney curator, because it also, uh, I presented some of this at the Whitney Museum in, uh, in um, uh, New York City. When I showed the Whitney curator the sort of plow that Sita came out of, she said, where's the plow? She is used to a big machine and a tiny man. With this plow, the man and the animals talk to each other as the small plow breaks the earth. This is uh, where my schools are, right? And that little boy is, in fact, Deba, one of our students. And he's talking to the to the, the to the oxen. He's saying pa 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 to go uh, forward and then tie tie to stop, etc. So when I showed the Whitney curator the sort of plow that Sita came out of, she said, "Where's the plow?" She's used to a big machine and a tiny man. With this plow, the man and the animals talk to each other as the small plow breaks the earth. So I, I move now. I would like to say much more, especially try to relate to what Ashish said, but I don't, I don't have that much time. So I move now to the collection of essays that is soon to be launched, Ishare Pratidandi or Onnanno Prabandho, essays from 1961 to 78. It is a book of genius. It's the only thing I can say. It is a book of genius, anticipating many debates that animate the critical scene today. World literature, translation in theory and practice, the responsibility and the task of the diasporic, global culture, accessing the subaltern, Chotolok, subaltern, feudality without feudalism. Emily Apter and I are planning a book of dialogues. Ishare Pratidandi, God's antagonist, will surely be part of that conversation. The book opens with an utterly brilliant discussion of how Tagore managed to lose his Euro-US Euro audience. Part of it is, of course, the disappearance of Yeats and Pound, who were helping Rabindranath with the translation. It's a well-known story, but Navarita's analysis is unusual. Reading her, I felt the same rage that I felt when in 1963, at the age of 21, I went to teach at the Yates Summer School in Sligo and W.B. Yates' son, Senator Yates, who looked just like his dad, told me that once really a man without any sense, told me that once he heard his father muttering to himself to keep his rowing for exercise in Cool Lake, Rhythmical, and when he, the son, got close enough, he heard his father saying, Rabindranath Tagore, Rabindranath Tagore. This is the story that this guy, the senator, tells a very young girl about her own culture. Can you imagine? Here, she, and she heard Nobunita anticipates in this piece, anticipates the world literature discussions that still confuse our professional life. I know she knew that David Damrosh had chosen Tagore as a world lit writer. But life did not give her time to re-enter these earlier texts. I engaged in a discussion of Tagore as a world writer with David Damrosh at an annual convention of the American Comparative Literature Association at Simon Fraser University in 2011. That transcript is constantly unloaded if the citation index is to be trusted. I harangued David Damrosh on Rabindranath's own piece called World Literature or Bisha Shahito, which he simply took to be the phrase to be a more euphonious synonym in Bengali for comparative literature itself. His extraordinary definition of the literary there is baje karuch or non-marketing spending without promise of deliverables. 
This I didn't share with my incomparable, and now the time has skipped by. In this early text, she also has an astute intuition, Nabunita does, of global networking as not only digital. English, the common pulse between person and world, the infinite seduction felt for the global music by the world's people, the rhythm that is at the root of the creation of the world is the same one that is in the world's people's blood. The poet will say this in all that he writes. In order to access the digital, not, to just, not just for cybercrime or pornography and so on, you have to have this, the training in this kind of pre or proto digital, only the computer in the head as it were, this kind of training, this kind of feeling. Nabunita and I were together in this. That's why I gave that introduction to Antara. We knew that this, what the, the Kobi writes, had to be taught. It wasn't enough for the poet to write it. We connected, Nobunita and I, as teachers. I'm not a very good teacher, but Nobunita was apparently amazing. And we did, of course, share, as I said, some very good teachers. Shukumari Bhattaji must not be forgotten. This is why I will cite here Nobunita's invocation of Chotalok within quotes and pushing on to teaching. We are tributaries here as well. The following passage was written on Sharad Chandra Chatterjee's centennial celebrations. I quote Nabunita. It wasn't hard for him to break up the gentlemanly tradition and become common. And of course, my translation here, it's always subaltern, although it's not quite correct, but Chotolok is really untranslatable. And here's what I wrote a couple of weeks ago and have been writing forever, even suggesting that it's not a bad translation for subaltern, though it's not quite appropriate. Here's my passage. Amra ki Chotolok er monon shilota shamonde dothishto abogato achi? Monon shil hote hole tinte jinishe dorta. Prothom, Shadhin chinta ke adesh palaner bandhan na bandha. Dityo jati bhed sreni bhed lingo bhed mon theke dur karat chishta kara. Jate jati sreni lingo nidvishe se pada na hai. Ebang sheshe samusha samadhanir madhya me kikore pada te hai. Shai prashikhan gramin shikhat dek dawa. Or thak monon shilota akash theke pade na. Aami bol chi. Bangali bhadra lok ke brihattaro bangir monon shilota samundhe shachitan hote. Chhoto lok ke bacha ke manush kote, nije manush kote. Shudhu awa ka khawar inge jiyong ko na puriye. Ganotantrik apura shikhat chinta ki kore shishu o balok balika de gyan na diye obhash karana jaye. Shai chinta nije doinandin kajkar me upureo abustha shapekho bhabe ghaare tule nite. Vidha shagore rabogna নিজের উপর চালাতে কেউ কিছু করবেন না জানি আমি খালি কথার ভার নামাচ্ছি সুবিধা মতো ভিক্ষা দিতে কিছু লোক রাজি থাকেন টাকা বাড়ি বই কিন্তু এই সক্রিয় চিন্তায় কাজ সময় কোথায় সময় কোথায় সময় কোথায় ইংলিশ ডু উই নো ইনাফ অ্যাবাউট সাবার্ট অ্যান্ড কগনেশন ইউ নিড থ্রি থিংস ফর কগনেটিভ পারফরমেন্স ফার্স্ট নট টু টার্ন ফ্রি থিঙ্কিং ইন টু ওবিডিয়েন্স সেকেন্ড Try to remove gender caste and class differences from your own mind. And finally, to train the teachers in problem solving teaching practice. In other words, functioning cognitive behavior doesn't fall from the sky. I'm asking the Bengali gentleman to become aware of, of the cognitive behavior of a larger Bengal, to become human through trying to bring up subaltern children not to confine education to the alphabet, English, and arithmetic, but to take up the thought of how to make the thought of democratic ethics part of the habitual practice of children without sermonizing situationally over and above one's own daily grind. To apply Bidda Shagor's contempt 
upon oneself. No one will do anything, I know. I'm just easing off the burden of words. Some people are ready to give arms by convenience, money, buildings, books. But this imaginative activism, where's the time? Where's the time? Where's the time? Nobunita says of Sharad Chandra, he wanted to be a reader's writer. And here is the tributary, speaking from the other side of Pratima Ghosh as a reader critic. Uni nije Rabindranath diye toigi, e katha onek bhabe amader janiyechen. Kaje jante ki ajante bujhechilen je ei torun kobi de sob upolabdhi guli je uni Rabindranath ene samadha korechen. Eta tar pat bostunishtho niropekkho nobyaktik bornatok bichar noy. Ebong amar kache nijer pather shima onubhob korai mahottomo pat. English she let us know in many ways that she was made of Tagore. So she understood, witting or unwitting, that her way of solving all the affects of these young poets by way of Tagore, that was her reading, not a judgment, impersonal, substantive, neutral, descriptive. And for me, it is the best reading that feels its own limits. The book is full of extraordinary critical analyses, especially of translation. The best is when, after comparing, it's really a tour de force. The best is when, after comparing the translations of Malahme's Ongwas by Roger Fry and Shudhinana Dotto, Navonita translates the poem herself. It's extraordinary. Gender analysis is also our common bond. She knew, as do some of us, that reproductive heteronormativity holds the world before it's worlded. And she asks everyone to read Narir Mullo. In 1851-52, the impatiently innovative Martinican medical student of psychiatry, Franz Fanon, had proposed a complete lysis or cellular dissolution of the colonizing semiosis or sign system with which he was supposed to make meaning out of his life and develop a method to collect the ingredients for a pluralized sign system for the colonized. And Nobonita at the age of 28, far from innovative psychiatry in France, writes, Probashi John Mantor Kishahoj, Taragi Mool John Mirakam Rituto Bhatadaka. Look at this, this, this the, 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 the parallel and the connection. Is diasporic reincarnation so easy? Isn't a death of the root birth necessary? And then in one of the essays on Kamal Mujumdar, written with meticulous attention to detail, as is everything in this collection, we get the statement about putting to together the ingredients for life world signifying semiosis, the other point that Fano makes, a point of view implicit in the entire collection. I quote, Amader Bortomaner Odditio Mukher Chayadhavar Moto Prokrito Oiti Hashik Dorpon Amra Akono Goremite Parini Hate Dorte Parini Kutibate Dekte Chestako Chibote Sharbudai Kinto Dekte to Pachina Amader Shokio Obranto Mokachoviti English We have not yet been able to build, to hold in our hand a proper historical mirror to catch the reflection of our singular present face. We are certainly looking, trying to see it at all times, but we can't quite see the face that we unmistakably made ourselves. I edit a projected bilingual series, I've mentioned it already, of a thousand years of Bengali texts. I'm Nabunita's tributary here. For 56 years ago, she said, what I now echo. Nabunita, target bhasha, or tat jay bhasha te onubad ki kara habe, sheti jar matri bhasha, amun lokek dara onubad na hole, she lekha kakhono prano baan hai na. Jara bangla shikhe ni hai, Rovino Nath ke shah bhasha hai onubad kutte ego ben. This idea, of course, makes me very unpopular, because in a formerly colonized country, how well you know English somehow is a mark 
of your excellence, your human quality. Anyway, here's, here's the English. If the translation, Nabunita writes, is not by a person whose native language is the target language or the language in which the translation will be done, the text will not come alive. The title of my forthcoming book on translation is called Living Translation, Coming Alive, for this very tributary intertextuality or comparison. But look at what I write in one of the introductory presentations for the series. The meticulously annotated bilinguality of these volumes will be a contribution to Bengali instruction. Look at Bangla Shigwe, Kali translation for Vina. We plan to ask the American Institute of Indian Studies to endorse and use the series for their longstanding scholarly and ped pedagogic activities. Nobunita does not mention that post-colonial folks tend to translate from imperial language translations. I told my beloved Aniket Jawari, who wanted to translate Gramsci, that he should not translate from the poor English translations. He tried to learn Italian and then said, no, it can't be done. But Nobunita's tough thinking of translation as a theoretical practice can certainly take this on board. A last word about Komal Mojumdar. Nobunita reads him with extraordinary care and dismisses his work as merely harmful. Here I would ask for another way of remembering our undergraduate instruction, to say yes to the enemy, a hard task. This way in the imagination, this way of teaching reading is to efface oneself as far as possible and attempt to enter the space of the poem, to wish as it wishes, to experience it as a field of desire from within. When such reading is carefully practiced, the reader attempts, however unverifiably, to inhabit the desires in inscribed in the text in question. We do not think that the desires are fulfilled in the text. The desire is like a watermark that writes each page and underneath and over. It's a very different way of reading. A hard task, but perhaps worth trying. As I approach 80, I realize more and more that history is like a relay into the vanishing present. And here, in my tribute to the incomparable, perhaps I take a halting step to carry the baton from her, a relay. Yes, we celebrate her. Life affirming, yes, Ashish. We celebrate her as we mourn. But there is an emptiness in my heart. I will never share with my friend again, except in imaginative exchange, which cannot be covered by a tribute. Thank you. Thanks for a really very, very special and splendid tribute. Thank you very much. Um, Ashishta. Ashishta, will you take a I don't have anything to ask. <clears throat> but if anybody has any questions, maybe we could admit a few of them. This is an opportunity we have to, to ask Gayatri to spell out some of the things he has, he has said, these very important things, you know. Dr. Spivak has agreed to take a few questions. So if there are questions, um, you could raise your hand, please. I think. If you get scared, I know. I'm scared. 
to, the, first to ask question, the first question is always a problem, then the deluge. There are Abhilasha. Um, okay. Ma'am, this is Abhilasha and firstly, I'd like to thank you for such an intrinsic and insightful session. So ma'am, my question was, can you please kindly elucidate uh, that how intertextuality sort of problematizes the concept of uh, diasporic, the complications that uh, arise consequently? So I would like to know your views on that. Thank you. Can I take three questions? Then more people will ask questions and I'll answer together. Is that all right? Okay, yes. ma'am. Thank you so much. Always have been an admirer. Well, today maybe that will change. <laughs> Let, me, <laughs> Let me get another one. Come on, Lakshmi, ask me a question. That's the only no person I saw whom I know. It's It's hard to think of a question from the top of my head. Just give me a minute and I'll try and articulate. Except just to say, Gayatridi, this has just been really moving and inspiring. Um, and I was just wondering, and this just came out as I was listening to your uh, juxtaposition of the epic on Sita and Nabhanitadi's reading and your own reading. I was just thinking how one could uh, try and expand this conversation with some of the work that um, Hindi literature came with in the 1920s and 30s when a whole lot was written on the neglected women. And that was also part of a cultural agenda, but interestingly by sections of the Hindu right. And I ask this question because I think at some point we may need to initiate a more nuanced conversation on this. So I was just uh, thinking aloud and I was thinking of uh, all the poems I'd read of the neglected women and this particular reading of Sita really uh, made a huge impact and I think it's largely to do with the way you associate her with the earth and with ecological affirmation. So I can only say thank you and uh, certainly made me think again. Wonderful. Now is there a third person who is who there is, is uh, Motumonti. Motumonti okay. has their hand. Uh, is, uh, there is someone called Motumonti who has put up her hand. Thank you. Yeah, I hope I'm audible. Uh, okay. So that, that was a, a wonderful, wonderful, um, you know, insight into um, uh, Nobunita Devshain's works. It was, I, I really have no words. So ma'am, my question is, uh, so, uh, could you uh, elaborate on uh, uh, the theoretical viewpoints of uh, eco-feminism and eco-spirituality uh, while talking about uh, Shita Theke Shuru? Okay. <clears throat> I'm, I don't really have answers to these questions. I'll share my problems with you so that that's the way we'll go. Okay. Because now, first of all, intertextuality and how it changes um, within the diasporic situation. Well, I don't think it needs to change. Eh? In what did I, how did I describe intertextuality? I described intertextuality as two webs, you know, the World Wide Web, that's a text, right? That, because in Latin, texere is weaving. I'll tell you, the, uh, when I uh, used to work in Purulia, I used to go singing. I could walk then, we would walk miles together with the women and we would sing together, right? And they would, what they would say, Didi, at the Ganbuno, weaving, you see, Ganbuno. So this idea that you weave a textile, a textile that you weave, in, in fact, intertextuality can help the diasporic and the uh, and the located, you know, the one who's located in the, the old country and the one who has gone away. Intertextuality, if the difference is studied and kept, because if one says identity, then it doesn't work because the diasporic might be diasporic in the Gulf states pushing a wheelchair. The diasporic might be diasporic in the United States getting shot or the diasporic might be like some of us metropolitan diasporics well-placed teaching at universities 
So therefore, what you have to think of is that intertextuality is a way, is, is, a, is, a, is an analyzed way of joining. And sometimes intertextuality can even work without any sense of, uh, without any sense that it is happening. Now, I will tell you something if I can find that text in the book, then I will tell you something. You know what happened with the people who went to Africa, who went to uh, Haiti from Africa, from Benin, which was then called Dahomey, etc., Dahomey, Congo, etc. What they did was they took actually their gods with them, and they would actually they were diasporics, okay. And what they did was they would actually make the, they would bring the gods up and they would talk about Africa coming in and so on as they were actually dancing with the gods and want to be possessed by the gods in a sense the way in which Nobunita was describing Buddha did. Now that is really a that is really a way of of uh, intertextuality. Um, yes, I have, I have uh, found the little song. They, 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 uh, they celebrated, I mean, they were from Africa, brought in as slaves, you know, they, in, in Haiti, in Haiti. And they would uh, dance like this and they would celebrate Christmas. So on Christmas day, look at this, intertextuality with Catholicism and with their gods in Africa, but they're <coughs> actually in the West. <coughs> Listen to this. I, I'm, I, I'm not going to read the Creole. I'm just reading the, the uh, English. Day is dawning in Africa. They're singing these, uh, these slaves in, the, in, in, uh, in Haiti. They're singing, Nabune Julouvri, Julouvri, Guinea is Africa. Day is dawning in Africa. And the cock crowing, Cocorico, Coclap, Chate, Cocolico. Three Patas, Three Ave Marias. This is from Catholicism. Wangalo, who's leading the African, who has left Africa. So this, this diaspora, we don't think of this kind of non-metropolitan diaspora. This is an extraordinary thing. This wanting to be possessed by the God they brought. It really reminds one of the original diaspora, Alexandria. They, the Jews took their gods as well. So to an extent, the idea of diaspora and intertextuality is extremely you've asked a very important question but it must not be identification then it's just a class-based kind of a continuity which is very bad for the world today as for lakshmi lakshmi you see that's the if you, if i had had the time to show the whole reading that i had and, and then you would have seen that in fact your comment that's something that I actually make in the, in the video itself. I say that unfortunately, it is possible to identify with this uh, Ramana and become in fact, um, uh, totally a kind of religious fundamentalist. It's not, it's not, it's something that we have to treat like medicine and poison. So that, you know, you have to teach dosage. It's not something you throw away because religion to an extent is the only public sphere to which the subaltern has access. I, I try to go through proverbs quite often when I'm trying to teach because the public sphere <coughs> is they're denied the public sphere. That's the definition of the subaltern, right? They cannot be generalized. So therefore the idea of, of always being very careful about the, the possibility of it actually undermining any kind of um, secular transcendental is very, very important. And what is important is our wealth of languages, not just Hindi, but in fact, the other, other languages um, uh, in India. And uh, this is really my hope in the, uh, and was Navanitas, by the way, Indian comparative literature. And uh, so therefore, it seems to me that this is work that we can do together. After all, Lakshmi, you and I are in a group that works together. So this is something that might be interesting. And then uh, the last one, eco-feminism, Modhumurti. See, 
uh, I'm not sure that uh, I'm, I'm very much for the idea that we should now be able to think that um, the, the, that every every presupposition should change because the merus are melting, and that and in fact it's going to be much sooner. It's already begun. That future is already here. But it does seem to me that it can't be hyphenated with various. I mean, it can. You can do anything. But if you hyphenate it with various named movements, I think the demand that is being made for, upon us, and I would very humbly like, because it's easier to do this when you're writing carefully, I would very humbly like you to look at the footnote, at the keynote footnote, at the keynote I gave uh, to the Asia Society in New York on their museum summit. And I took as my topic, the land acknowledgement that the Metropolitan Museum, the biggest, most um, imperial colonizing uh, museum that has it has taken, it is acknowledging the fact that it's built on Native American land, the Lenape and so on and so forth. But of course, it's disingenuous. I mean, you know, that incredible building. And then they're just telling, we are, you know, you can't you cannot just uh, just repay your debt by putting up a brass land account, but it's good, it's good, there's an opening. So I wanted to go th through it and I've written there as carefully as possible, the answer to your question as far as I can go there. I do not think that it can be appropriated into because that eco, the prefix has completely changed in terms, I mean, we must be able to think now that all of us in some way, all of us, including Mesopotamia and agriculture, we must be able to think that all of us stand on land that was not owned by anyone. Another thing to read is the end of Capital Volume One, so-called, Marx says so-called, Zogenante, primitive accumulation, the capitalization of land. You don't need factories. That's, that's how you begin our Amen Roy, after all he was silenced, but he was able to say for the common term that it's a different thing for the, uh, the, the peasant um, countries, the peasant commune countries, that he was shut up. He went away, as you know. But that idea in the, at the, the last chapter of Capital Volume One, you see how carefully, phenomenologically, Marx is saying, don't think land, there is no land because it's a phenomenological form of appearance. Don't think labor, there is no labor, says Marx, I quote. And so to an extent, we really have to be ready for a complete change of mind that cannot happen. It, it's an impossible kind of thing because human beings are, as you well know, they are made to exceed their need. They can make more than they need. So therefore, this excess is what destroys the world. So therefore, to an extent, it's not possible to have eco anything. Therefore, we have to think it through in another way. You notice I really have shared my problems with all three of you, wonderful questions, and maybe there's future work together in our shared future. I'll be 80 next month. I'm not long for this world, but nonetheless, I keep affirming life. Do you realize I met Ashish when I was 14, also in 1956, right? Ashish, no, 55, actually, 55, end of 55, November 55. That's when we met. Okay. Can I ask a last question? Ask Ashish. Ashish is the one who will permit you. Can I'm I only please, the speaker. Can I please okay. ask the last question, sir? <clears throat> you are there. Can I yeah. ask? I think I think there are a, a few more questions. There are three. Uh, I see three hands on the. Um, on the screen, and there are some more that have come in in the chat. 
So if uh, Dr. Nandi allows them, then maybe we could quickly ask these questions. Yeah? Shall we allow the questions? I think there are now a number of questions have come up, but mm -hmm. there were uh, there were Priti Shengupta, Shatabdi Das, Abhirbha Bhattacharya on the screen and in the chat box. There's uh, Samir Saxena uh, and there's um, Shantana Bhattacharya. Okay, I'll take three. Three. I can do more. I can keep in my head. Okay, then I think we'll go in order of uh, uh, appearance. Um, uh, chronologically, Sami <clears throat> Saxena had put it in the chat box some time ago. It was the question was how can the middle class impact the lives of Chotolok in a positive way? That's one. Um, Shantwana Bhattacharya had uh, asked. Are we moving from a position of suppression of the subaltern voice to the appropriation of it? Amake yes. emotionally, uh, she she had said this in an emotional way to me at one time. Are we moving from a position of suppression of the subaltern voice to the appropriation of it? These are the two questions that have already come in on the chat. And uh, if we are taking one more. Then I guess Deva Priti Sengupta has been the uh, one who has been waiting among the ones with the uh, hands up on the screen. Yes, I just wanted to ask that in Navunita Devshin's Shita Theke Shuru, when Shurponaka comes to seduce Lakshman, and Lakshman initially gives uh, his way to him, but then as Shita arrives, he completely transfers all the responsibility towards Shurponaka. So I just wanted to ask that can we relate Shurpanaka to the prostitute or to the third will in the uh, in a relationship between the man and the woman? When the legal wife, the woman comes into the uh, scene, the prostitute immediately is transferred all the responsibility uh, towards. And the man is just, you know, the, the prostitute has seduced the man. So all the responsibility is on the prostitute, just like Shurponaka has seduced Lakshman and all the responsibility is now on Shurponaka. So is it in this way is how the feminine theory is working. I just wanted to ask that. Thank you. Okay. So how can the middle, you know, at the, I don't think there's a general answer to how can the middle class. It really depends on, I mean, the middle class is not just the middle class. I mean, I, you know, I'm an ignorant person. I'm not, I mean, I, I'm a literary critic. God knows you don't learn anything for a literary PhD. And you know, I don't know anything. I'm just really, all my answers of, of this sort, they come out of what is called activism. I work in the field. So that's the only thing I have. So it seems to me that the middle class and please don't mind, you know, the 19th century philosopher with a PhD in classics, uh, with Karl Marx, in other words, he, the, he seems to be an interesting writer. For many of us, he's my brother. I don't, I'm, you know, I read and change and try to historicize, et cetera, et cetera, poetry of the future, et cetera. Take me to be that kind of a person, okay? So that's how I'm going to answer. See, I do believe that if you have in order to be a class, you have to have a certain kind of class consciousness in terms of the way the production situation is in a country. And I believe that word, the middle class, doesn't really give us much of that sort of consciousness. The middle class is extremely diversified. I'm myself politically against private sector volunteerism, okay? That's what I do in my schools. I go there, hang out, teach, live with them, et cetera. I'm politically actually against private sector volunteerism. I'm a bit of a Rosa Luxemburg style social Democrat. I work with the state if uh, at the bottom layers, not, uh, I'm not into leadership, et cetera. I mean, anyway, who the hell would want me to lead? They would be really dumb. But in, in, from the bottom, 
you know, like the block development officers, that's the first job in the civil service, they still have some, uh, some idealism left. And in fact, you know, every time I go last, uh, last day, the, I have to earn their respect, right? So therefore, I mean, because they're not dumb, they do also say, they can also say, oh yes, they should that question, et cetera. So the, the, I have to earn their respect, but now because they can see that I'm tr really trying to learn the answer to your question by hanging out there and seeing how the hell I can efface myself and do something and use my privilege, et cetera, et cetera. Every time I go in the evening, they come and they sometimes stay until 9, 9.30 in the evening with the lantern lit and um, the guy from Tagore Society sitting in the back and I get Shondesh uh, and Shingara for them so that my coworkers can also eat and we talk and they give me information and sometimes we lower our voice. So this is a middle-class story. I'm met totally metropolitan middle-class, top drawer. So, I mean, I'm not upper middle-class, but I certainly think of myself as extremely privileged and compared to them, tremendously rich. I'm not rich, but compared to them, my goodness. So therefore, and I say this to them, you must do without me, I'm your enemy. You know, my father was good, my mother was good, and I think I'm good. But two generations don't undo 8,000 years. You must do without me. So therefore, how the middle class can do, I haven't succeeded yet. I've been doing this for 35 years. This kind of stuff does not get undone. That is to say, me so super highly educated, actually going into their space, which was completely shut off because they were punished for intellectual labor and uh, rewarded for obedience, etc. I so I, you know this is th this is an effort which is which is coming from a humanities person. So therefore, the broad question: How can the middle class? You try yourself and see how long it takes you to have a collective answer. How long it takes you even for any kind of collective to take you seriously. That's, you see, this is what I would like and how long, how you can, how people uh, pretty low down in the state can uh, want to do something with you, for you. See, if I had more time, I would tell you the story of the moving of the, of the whatchamacallit, of the light pole in my, in Gangmuri with our offices. The, it's, a, it's, a, it's a complicated question. One thing I will say, the guy, whom I met at the, uh, the first time, 1998, uh, he was a block development officer. He was a member of the Kapugati Hill Club, so he knew who I was, right? And nobody knows, I mean, nobody knows who I am, but he knew. And so he and I stuck together. He tested me in many ways. And at one point, we do a kind of land cop, cop thing. Mute yourself, mute yourself, whoever you are. We were doing a kind of land co-op thing. The, and he said, my goodness, Gatidi, you are doing real land reform. You're, this is real Maoism. So I wasn't doing Maoism. But then I saw that what they wanted was what, like what the rural gentry do. You know, I buy land for them. And then they will do that kind of sharecropping. With, and they know that I don't like to stay with one caste. So they will take all the tribals and it's, 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 they will do sharecropping. So I said to the to the Bijnigam, the state Bijnigam, sorry, I'm not for this for this project. This they've written this project and I've just read it on the train. I had no time. This is not. So this guy, my friend, says to me, Gatidi, apni palenna, apni chedilin. And I said, look, when you read my book and you hear and you read an English sentence that institutional change and subjective change, transformation, are not isotemporal or isomorphic. You understand that sentence. When I'm saying it in Bengali with these, exactly the same thing, with these people, you don't understand it anymore. What's your problem? You think that those sentences are only written in books? So therefore, this whole question of how the middle class has to be broken down so that these generalizations become, you can write books with the generalizations, but practice norms what you write in your book.
So the, 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 the book is a halfway house. As Emerson said, for a scholar's idle times. So th therefore, that's how a wonderful question. The second one, are we suppressing, appropriating? No, I think that question comes from, I, I know Nabunita Di once said to you, Nabunita and I would sit down. I didn't always say, Nabunita, you're right. The, who is the we, I would ask. Who the hell is the we? There are so many, it, it's the same kind of question. You can, in fact, be, you see, Surya knows a little bit of this because he's learned a good deal of Bengali. He's actually, his mother tongue is English because he's in Indian American, not born in India. So, but he has learned a good deal. He's still learning. He, he can read, write, etc., etc. So he, and so sometimes I, in, I let him be on Zoom silent and sometimes talking on our, uh, on our uh, teaching sessions when I'm not there. And so, therefore, wanting to be able to hear and doing the bureaucratic egalitarianism that is called democracy, mostly, that is so very difficult. So to make a generalization like this, we used to suppress them before, now we appropriate their voice. You define who we is. Because, you know, I get a lot of this from memes and Facebook and this and that. Luckily, I don't do Facebooks, but other people show me. And I say to myself, I don't want publicity because that would ruin the work. I would get audatito, uh, uh, income production and computers and this and that. I don't need it. This is an intellectual project. So therefore, the, I don't have a web page. I don't have any publicity. I don't have anything. And this, well, I mean, it's not a secret, but what happens is, I even have said in a th thing that will be forthcoming in Onushtuk, the next issue, don't come to see us. We are not a zoo. There's no place for anything. No doubt if you want to be with us, you'll have to work with us. You have to be able to teach geography, geometry, um, uh, algebra, um, uh, whatever you like in a Bengali that local children will understand. If you can do that, and not behave like, oh, it's so nice Montessori school type person. That doesn't work with them. This is that definition of child is middle class. So therefore to say such a thing, it's heartbreaking. You first define who the hell the we are who are appropriating the voice of the subaltern. What is, what is it to appropriate? You know, they're citizens, they're citizens, someone, I mean, I have privilege, not a great deal, but some, I should use it for them and say, do without me. The shortcut is listening to you because I'm there. Don't you understand? This is, this is a problematic field. It's not so easy. And I think to dismiss it that way, it's a luxury of the elite. I do not accept that question. I would say like Ronald uh, Colombach said, what's in it for you? Colombach said from time to time, that you, you, some people ask a question and you should ask this question because it's so nice to take her down. She lives in the United States, big deal. This is not, this is, you ask yourself this thing and especially citing Mabunita who can't speak up for herself. She would walk up and embrace me. She would walk up and embrace me, believe me. The, and then the, um, very real question it is. It's a very real question. Uh, as if these are real people, as if, uh, you know, we have to think about the fact that these are not real people. Dejone on Nabunita was doing that thing about it's fiction. And you see this idea of the prostitute, you know, it's, and the marriage, et cetera, et cetera. This is, a, this is, yes, this is, more or less, this is how it is. More or less, this is how it is. But it's not always, this is, you know, uh, one of my maternal side, mother's side ancestors, Prashad Das Goswami, Prashad Das Goswami, Prashad Das Goswami, these are bad people they were. He took his, his uh, chief uh, prostitute, uh, his concubine, he took her to court in order to deprive his mother of property. His wife, Nettukali Devi, who should belong to this discussion, she took his father dark and everything 
you know, all, uh, all uh, her life, married life, at, after he finished eating, but never spoke to him at all. It's a kind of contempt that she could show from within because there was no other way of dealing with it. We all, when I pay income tax in the United States, I think of Netto Kalide. Because after all, I know 58 cents in the dollar is going for defense. There's blood on my hands, but I'm paying. So this, this business of this business of having to do some things in order to live within a structure, it's not something that one can just point at differently by saying marriage and prostitute and so on. So uh, because then one needs to ask the question of polygamy. See my student Kofi Anidoho has eight mothers, right? They're Christians. And you know, I just have one of his books right here. And, uh, but uh, he has eight mothers. So what do you, and you know, African men and even African women, sometimes I won't say all, I'm not generalizing. They defend polygamy rather than the kind of uh, lie ridden uh, situation that uh, exists within so-called monogamous. So I think your question is very real, but I think what also happens in Nobunita's presentation is that it is clearly shown that she is much physically stronger than the men. And so whatever is happening, we have to read it. And if you and I were sitting down together with the book, then we would have a little reading session as to how in the rhetoric of the reading, it wouldn't be just as if they were real characters, you know, just gossip about non-existent people. A fict fictive text, this is why we are literary people, right? A fictive te text is not the same as just uh, human beings behaving in one way or another. Even Freud used to say that he could see in literary texts things that he couldn't see in his work with his patients, his analysis. And so he actually used the, uh, the uh, expression, experience of the impossible, that in literary texts, that was another way of reading from ours, that in a literary text, he could get an experience of the impossible, in, especially in his uh, text called the uncanny, Unheimlich, that, that one. So therefore, you and I would sit down together. It's not just, they're not real people. And uh, it's being, sometimes things are staged in a certain way to criticize that. So it, you can even criticize by doing something that is usually done. I'm sorry we can't talk a little more. Devo priti to manam. Tomu tumi bala uchit na hai kaushal, ashi gota gota. Anyway. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am, it's completely okay. Okay. Anyway, so thank you for your question. I've done three. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Um, um, uh, Ashishta, would you, any closing remarks? Ashishta, can you hear me? Ashishta, unmute yourself. Ashishta, okay. yes. Uh, I think Antara should have the last word. Well, thank you. I think, uh, um, uh, I speak on behalf of all of us here, and, and uh, especially on behalf of uh, Bez, uh, Opu, and my sister, and me. And it's just been so wonderful. I'm so, but really, really touched that uh, you spent. I mean, not just time, and and uh, you actually read. Um, Ishwari Pratidvandi, which is which is now being proofed, and uh, it was an old book, and with such uh, such passion and all the things that you have said, I just I really wish my mother could have heard you. Um, but anyway, thank you so much, and uh, thank you very much, Ashita, and. Uh, uh, we also need to thank uh, Sabi Ramit, who's organized the, the technical part of it. Thank you very much. And also Surya Pari, who uh, is in New York with uh, Dr. Shkriba, organizing the technical part from there. And 
all of you who have come today, thank you very much. I'll ask uh, Opu if, if there's anything that you want to say. Thank you, thank you. Thanks a lot, really. I mean, I've been, I knew it would be a great lecture, but I'm really, really very touched. And I'm sure most of us here are. I see a lot of people in the audience. Um, like I also see Professor Matthias Sen, Professor J.B. Uh, Prasanna Patala, mm -hmm. and many others. Um, they're all in different parts of the world. And I'm, I'm grateful mm -hmm. that someone has woken up early or someone is staying up late to uh, be part of this. Thank you. Okay. ঠিক আছে সবাইকে ধন্যবাদ আজকে দেজের এই পঞ্চাশ বছরে নবনীতা দেবসেনের তৃতীয় বর্ষের যে স্মারক বক্তৃতা আপনারা শুনলেন আপনাদের সকলকে শুভরাত্রি জানিয়ে আজকের এই অনুষ্ঠান এখানেই শেষ করছি নমস্কার